I'm so excited to have Steve Almond here. How many of you are um, listeners to the Dear Sugar podcast? You have fans. It's about 3%. 3%. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, Dear Sugar is a podcast that Steve and his co-host Cheryl Strayed do about life's thorniest problems. Um, Steve is also an author of um, eight books, half fiction, half nonfiction. And he regularly teaches nonfiction to fellows in the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard and literary journalism in Wesleyan. And um, I've been listening for a long time, but in researching for this discussion, I realized that you grew up in Palo Alto, which is where I live. You and I both turned 50 this year. Yes. <laughs> you had to mention it. Sorry. And it was just like last week, right? Yes. Okay. Happy birthday. Um, and you attended Wesleyan University, and I actually went on my junior year to France with Wesleyan University. So a lot of parallels. But I discovered the podcast about a year ago, and the reason I wanted to bring Steve here today is I think so often we look for inspiration as creatives in places that are too vertical. We look in advertising-centric media. And I found that the more I listened to Dear Sugar and the way that you and Cheryl kind of unpack these unbelievably thorny problems, was especially good for me to kind of retrain my brain about how to approach problems. So I then promptly texted my sister and said, you need to listen to this podcast. And about a week later, I got a text from her that said simply, I think I'm a little bit in love with Steve Almond. <laughs> to which I replied, get in line. <laughs> um, because you just have such a thoughtful approach to some very, very challenging problems. So, in a way, I almost feel like when I listen to the show, um, the letters that people write to you are the creative brief. The discussion that you and Cheryl have is a really, really good kickoff meeting. And I see a lot of qualities of good creatives in your problem solving. And it's trained me to not always answer questions that are phrased to me. And I'll give you an example. Um, when Sports Illustrated put a very curvy model on its swimsuit issue this past winter. <laughs> or every past winter. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, like especially like a larger woman. I got a call from um, Advertising Age, or I can't remember, a reporter saying, what are your thoughts? Do you think this is awesome that Sports Illustrated put a curvy model on its cover? And I said, you are asking the wrong question. They have 52 weeks a year to spotlight female athletes and they don't. So I am not gonna make a comment about the size of the woman wearing a bikini on one of those weeks. And I think that's the way we need to retrain ourselves to not always answer the question we're asked. So today what we're gonna do is we are going to listen to, I'm gonna read shortened versions of three letters that Steve and Cheryl have answered, and then I'm gonna play you a short sound bite that really spoke to me about how you guys answered it, and then we're gonna talk about what you, what you were doing there, like what kind of problem solving. Okay. So the first letter, and these are a little bit edited down. Dear Sugars, my boyfriend and I have been together for five and a half years and he has yet to propose marriage. We are in a loving relationship. He is my best friend. We have lived together for two of these years and we've been on vacation with each other's families. When I bring up marriage and children, he tells me he wants the same things I want. He says I'm the one and he has made comments about what our wedding would be like, but I haven't seen any signs that he might be saving for a ring or planning a proposal. This year, as our five-year anniversary approached, I made it clear that I wanted to get married soon and that I would not wait around much longer. When his holiday gift to me was a scarf and some inexpensive earrings, I burst into tears. <laughs> Have any of us been there? Um, <laughs> I told him that I was so tired of hoping and being disappointed. He was genuinely sorry that he had disappointed me. He said the idea of proposing and getting married makes him nervous. I know he feels financial pressure as this year has also brought a small business and is struggling to get it off the ground. I'm worried, I think he's worried about establishing himself in a career before proposing, but at this point in our relationship, if he can't even make a mutual sacrifice to split holidays, should I want to marry him, leaving him would break my heart. Sugars, what should I do? Sincerely, patient. So we're about to listen to Steve Almond. What you said to this woman, I, I listen to the podcast when I am in the bathtub after working out. <laughs> And I literally sat up in the bathtub. It was one of those moments. So let's play this sound clip of what you said. Sure. It is so interesting, Cheryl, when a man wants to get married, it's called a proposal. And when a woman wants to get married, 
It's called an ultimatum. Wow. Wow. That just, that's what we call in our business a key insight. Um, <laughs> like, I almost feel like that could be the headline of a campaign for De Beers Diamonds, for women to buy themselves their own stuff. But <laughs> um, you really kind of honed in on the fact that marriage is still a man's realm and that we are at the mercy of a man's timetable. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, her question to you was, should she stay or should she go? She's questioning herself, but you gave her back the power of her own conviction. So yeah. tell me, why is that almost more important than answering a yes or no question? Well, the letter, there's this other possibility that isn't even articulated in the letter, which is that somebody who wants something would ask for it. Yeah. She wants to get married. It was what Madonna said. You know, if, you, if you're interested in somebody, then text them. Uh, and I think there's a, we're so steeped in sort of patriarchal thought patterns and behavior patterns that simply realizing that if you want to get married, you can ask the person that you want to marry. And especially if you're a woman, you're allowed to ask a man. My wife proposed to me and I had to sort of get nervous about it, but I, but well, here's the whole story. I, I knew that I wanted to ask her to marry, but I was nervous about it because men are nervous. There's this economic anxiety. We're all buying into this fairy tale where the man gets on his knees and asks for the woman's hand. There's a lot of pressure all around in that arrangement. And it's not honestly discussed. Those anxieties yes. go unstated. It's just we're falling into some fairy tale narrative that's been imposed on us and not saying, why is this the narrative? So when she asked, I had already picked out a ring, but I hadn't, was too nervous to present it to her. And so when she said, well, will you marry me? I said, well, I don't know, I have to think about it. And then I ran, <laughs> I ran into the next room and I got that ring that I had been you know, storing and I put a little yes inside the ring and I closed the ring and then I gave it to her. So, well, but that was the result of us, I mean, that was a happy ending to what is a sad and common story, which yes. is that when this woman could have said to her boyfriend, look, I understand that you're feeling anxious and fraught, but you're great and we're gonna do this and we're gonna build a life together. And it's, a, it's either a yes or no, pal. Yes, exactly. Do you know what happened to that letter writer? I don't, I've been, I, I'm tr I will find out. Okay. I will, I will let you know. Okay, all right. Um, we're gonna move on to another letter that I remember when I emailed you to invite you to speak, I referenced this letter and you said it was one of the most commented upon, shared, kind of almost divisive letters. Yeah. Um, and I'll read you the letter first. Dear Sugars, I'm a 24-year-old college graduate in my first serious romantic relationship. This is from a guy, by the way. My experience with girls before this was extremely limited. I've been dating my girlfriend for over six months now and she's wonderful. However, her weight has always been a minor issue in the back of my mind. She is not fat, but she has a few extra pounds, and this can be seen more when she's wearing fewer clothes. I love her and would never ask or demand her to change just for me, but I've been thinking more and more about how her weight bothers me a little bit. I'm a very thin guy and have naturally had a preference gravitating physically toward thinner girls. I brought it up with her, and she did not respond with as much understanding as I hoped. <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> Can't understand. <laughs> she felt hurt and a little violated, like the one guy who is supposed to love and accept her and find her beautiful just the way she is was attacking a part of her identity. My question for you is, was I wrong for not being sensitive to how women think? Should I have let it go if I considered it a smaller issue in our relationship? Thanks, the question of weight. So we're gonna now listen to a sound clip where I think Steve and I were talking last night about how he and Cheryl um, seem to have very similar sensibilities at times. Yeah. But in this particular call, there was a lot of tension that you can hear between her perspective as a woman, his perspective as a man. And as you listen to them talking, I want you to think about how important it is to have all the brains in the room. Because if it was just two guys fielding this letter or just two women, I don't think they would have gotten as deep. So let's listen to the clip. What have you absorbed, question of weight, from the culture about what women should look like? And men, right? I keep saying. You know what? Yeah, you do. But I think that I really have to say, I think that 
you know, men are not put through this gauntlet. The way right, but this is this They're relationship, not. and he's saying, I'm a thin guy, and I've always been drawn to thin women. I'm saying he's not going to solve it entirely until he thinks not just about the pressures she's under and so forth, but his own self-concept and his own sense of masculinity. I think it's a piece of it that he needs to look at as well. So I think what was so interesting when I listened to that segment is that he can't change her, but he can cro- probe what's in himself that's bringing about his own discomfort. And you really got to that. Like Cheryl would just went right for the jugular about like unfair, not cool, politically incorrect, all of which are true. But I think it was so helpful to have your voice there. Um, and I know you told me that the phenomenon that you are intrigued with in a lot of letter writers is that most people have two stories they tell right. about their lives. One for the public and one that lives inside them is often less examined. And this letter is almost an exa- example. Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect example. Um, and th- men tend to weaponize their self-doubt. That's what they do. And uh, Cheryl was not, I don't think she was being politically correct, at least the way that term has been bastardized, which is an excuse to be cruel and indecent, mm-hmm. basically. She was saying this, this guy is putting his stuff on this woman in a way that is culturally reinforced and despicable. And that's true. But I was thinking, you know, on Dear Sugar Radio, I'm the 3%. Our listeners are probably 95% women. And so for me, I'm always trying to make sure, in a way, it's like moving through the world that you all move through. You just, you sort of realize that you have to be extra careful and attendant and sort of behave in a particular way. And in this letter, I felt Cheryl's animus towards this guy was totally justifiable and something he needed to hear, but he needed to hear something else as well, which is that his self-concept, his body image, everything he's absorbed from advertising culture and from pornography and everything else that he's consumed as a 24-year-old guy has made it impossible for him to not doubt himself and his body and his masculinity, and that part of the reason that he's judging her Mm. harshly is he's putting his doubt off on her. That's what people do, and I think men are especially good at it, and they're given permission to do it, and I will not mention the election. I think that's gonna be a theme here. Yeah. Um, (laughs) um, But in a way, like, I guess, I'm obviously not a guy, but maybe a man likes to feel like a protector of a woman in some, you know, ancient way and if she's larger than he is or it might mess with his own like you said sense of his own masculinity absolutely and if we were living as madonna set out in the time of the neanderthal okay absolutely that feeling of i i I have a bio evolutionary imperative to be bigger and stronger and the protector and maybe there's some vestigial trace of this but this is about i think this letter was really about a guy who is both um Uh, wants to be in this relationship but also doubts his masculinity and until that is really brought into the light it's just going to fester and he's going to put it off on somebody else that's right so um tell me a little bit about the process of how you and cheryl worked together because when you listen to the show obviously there's editing involved but you know you hear the letter as a listener and you're like oh there's no way they're going to find their way out of this one i mean some of the problems are so thorny and so dimensional and there's so much sadness in the expression and the language that the letter writers use. And then you guys seem to always come at it with so much clarity. So tell me what the process is like. Do you read the letters separately and then come together? Well, yeah, we read the letters, but real quick, you know, we don't do a lot of prep and we never talk about it because that always ruins it. You know, then you're sort of performing a version of a converse, an authentic conversation that you really need to have in real time. That's just always how you're, So that conversation I'm listening to is the first time you and she are talking yep, about it? Absolutely. Always. Wow. Beca- and it's always in the same room. It has to be in person because this really what people want isn't Um, I mean, I think they have a fantasy that they want advice, but what they really want is to tell their story, since to be a human being is essentially a kind of extended confession. People want their to be heard, and they want most of all permission to feel what they're feeling. I think that's really what they want, and that's a lot of what we're trying to supply, not here's the answer, uh, but much more, man, that sounds excruciating. That sounds really tough. Yes. And probably usually also when, when people are frightened and confused, there, there's a, a surface letter that's happening and then there's kind of the letter that's embedded that's unconsciously what they're thinking and feeling, like with this young guy who really was 
another version of that letter is I'm questioning my masculinity and worrying that I'm not a man enough for my girlfriend. Yep, exactly. Um, okay, let's move on to the last letter. Um, this is one that I think might be poignant for you to hear because it was on your Mother's Day um, airing mm -hmm. and um, your own mom uh, is calling in. You, you actually kind of, she's, she's only heard a little bit on the clip I grabbed, but um, she had just passed away before this aired and I know that that was a very bold thing, brave thing for you to do to air this. Um, but I want to read the letter and then listen to you, Cheryl, and your mom. Dear Sugars, I'm a 30-year-old living in New York. I have been ambitious my entire life, and I've had a very successful career thus far. I've always loved my work, taken pride in it, and I currently make more than my husband. We were actually not trying to have a baby, but our miracle arrived. Since he arrived three months ago, I've spent all of my time taking care of him. He's the new joy of my life. I wake up every day thinking of him, and I go to bed thinking of him as well. I never thought I would debate going back to work, but now I'm at a crossroads. I love my little boy and I can't imagine not being present for all of his firsts. Due to the nature of my profession, I wonder if she's in advertising, <laughs> it's impossible to be part-time. Do I quit the job I thought I loved to stay home with my baby and hope to regain my career once he's older? Or do I join the millions of other women who juggle motherhood and professionalism daily? Yours, debating mom. So let's listen to you, Cheryl, and your mom. Okay. Part of what I think I've realized, certainly in, in you know, being with Aaron and certainly reading your book and talking with all the moms who I know is <laughs> there's nobody, there's no ma who thinks they got the balance right. Mm -mm. There's no mom who's in this situation of two very strong drives, the drive to be with the baby or babies mm -hmm. at home and children, and the mm -hmm. drive to continue the work, the mm -hmm. important work that they feel they're called to do in the world. It seems to me that there's nobody, no mom, who says, I did it right, I did it perfectly. Right. Right. Well, and in like the case of my mom, right. it wasn't a drive to be in the world and pursue her career. It was the need to make so, money. Right. There was no personal passion that's associated with her work. She had mm -hmm. to go to work so that she could pay our bills. And in a certain way, I think that was difficult in a whole set of ways. But the dilemma that debating mom is facing is that it's really her ambition against her baby. And I guess what I would say is that that sense of I want to do it 100% is part of the culprit here. Mm -hmm. the, the idea that it, it can't be half measure, it has to be full measure. It has the feeling of the kind of expectation that we put on ourselves that makes ambitious people succeed, but that oftentimes makes them very unhappy along the way. Mm -hmm. And the way that you framed it, and I think Cheryl and I and even my mom are saying, maybe you need to try to reframe this dilemma so it isn't just work or the baby. I think I would ask you to consider whether it's a good idea to give yourself a moratorium. Just give yourself a few months to be at home with your baby and see how much you really enjoy that life. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, sadly, debating mom may not have the luxury of giving herself that time because it sounds to me like she has a job that she's either going to return to or she's going to lose. And, and I know this is sort of above and beyond debating mom's question, but yeah. what a shame as a culture that this woman is put in this position. Yeah, I mean, you have to really think about it because I think ambitious people, especially women, who have to face so many barriers inherently still, even as far as we've come, women still have to be extra hardcore. So she has this sense of like, I better keep my place here because I've worked so hard to get it. And if I step out of line for a second, it's going to be filled. Yeah. But try not to see it as a binary where your baby is the enemy of your ambition and your ambition is the enemy of spending time mm -hmm. with your baby. Wow. Could any of you relate to that? <laughs> um, you know, motherhood is an enormous issue in our industry. And actually, Liesen Stromberg, our COO, has a new book coming out in January called Work pause, thrive, how to pause for parenthood without killing your career, about exactly this phenomenon. And what I love that you did, Steve, that I think we all need to do in the creative briefs of our life and the creative briefs of our clients is we always, tr we tend to make things an either or instead of a both and. And I love that you honored both of her commitments and that she didn't have to do everything to full. I, also, what was not in that sound clip, I love Cheryl said, stay home, you'll be sick of him by nine months. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but 
One other thing that that call is emblematic of that you and Cheryl do selectively is call-in reinforcements. And I think that's an important lesson for all of us. If ever you're stumped, whether it's a personal problem or something at work, there is no shame in asking for help. And there is actually great insight that can be had. And bring, I've heard you call in psychologists, authors, family members. Right. How do you and Cheryl decide when to make that outreach? Yeah, we, uh, we reach the limits of our uh, insight and intelligence pretty quickly. In other words, you know, we <laughs> recognize that we don't know for instance, um, infidelity. We did three-part series about infidelity, and it was just apparent that there were people out there who, clinical researchers, who had studied this and talked with thousands of people and looked at a lot of the sort of literature around this, and we were best to call in that person to help us think about it. And when you do that, really, we really are just coming from our own very limited experience. We're trying to be empathic, radically empathic if we can, but we really, our views are occluded by our experience. We've just had our lives. And sometimes that's illuminating. Like for me, I recognize because my mom struggled with maternal ambivalence, I recognize and wrote a whole great book about it. I, I knew in the case of that call that Maternal ambivalence is the crime that dare not speak its name in our culture in this moment, that women are out there being told two completely contradictory and impossible things at the same time. You must achieve and be ambitious in a world that is still really essentially mostly run by men, and you must be a perfect parent. The moment you have a kid, you better be fully devoted to that or you will fail as a mother in the eyes of other mothers and the rest of the culture. That's an impossible bind to put a woman in. Um, in the case of the infidelity episodes, it was completely illuminating to, to, to hear from the expert, Esther Perel, if any of you know her work. Love her. Yeah, you know, she basically said, we, we kept thinking about the way that people think about infidelity. It's betrayal, it's sin, uh, you've got to somehow, can they find a way back and so forth. And Esther Perel basically tore that down and said, what did it mean? What human meaning did the affair have? because that's what it's about. What was being expressed? What did you need to go outside the marriage to experience? What were you trying to gain that had been lost within the context of the marriage? She was much less judgmental, much less locked into a kind of traditional yeah. view of infidelity as the bad thing. It was the infidelity is the thing that happened, it's Madonna said, it's the thing that happened. And then the question is, well, what did it mean? Because if you don't ask that question, you never get to the bottom of it. Yep, exactly. Um, well, for those of you who read our blog, while Steve and I were working on this talk, um, I got an email that Cindy Gallup forwarded to me from a woman in our industry that she had written just as an email to Cindy and then forwarded on to me about an impossible bind she was in professionally. And it was beautifully written yeah. and long and detailed. And I wasn't sure I was up to the task of providing an adequate answer. and so. I reached out to Steve and said, would you be willing to dear sugar a three percenter? Which he did on our blog. It was a recent um, post to our blog. Um, I encourage all of you to read it because you really have a gift of getting to the crux of what people are trying to express and where their agony is stemming from. So um, I think we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> that went fast. Um, but we have a break now, and Steve, you're going to be present for that. I think you'll I probably have people that want it. But I almost just wanted to introduce you and your work to this audience. You can get more of Steve every week. Is there a particular day they get posted? I don't always tune in on the right. Mostly Fridays and Saturdays, yeah, or somewhere it's Fridays usually, yeah. Okay, and trust me, like I've been listening. Even if there's an issue that doesn't relate to your life at all, in fact, especially if there's an issue that doesn't relate to your, your life at all, I gain so much insight in listening to how you and Cheryl approach it that connects to how I approach professional challenges. So I encourage all of you to become Dear Sugar listeners um, and take the cards that are on your chairs that have the questions, those are your icebreaker questions, the networking break, go meet someone you don't know, talk to them, have some coffee, and then we're gonna move into the themed networks. All right.